and welcome back to part two of our discussion on gene control and this part we're going to look at the prokaryotes. If you didn't see part one, click on the link up here for the video on eukaryotic gene control. In that video we talked about gene control in two levels. We talked about cell differentiation with the uh, packing and unpacking of DNA, DNA methylation and histone acetylation, just making parts of the genome available for transcription other parts not. And then in the day-to-day, -day, moment to moment adjustments of cellular production, we talked about the different controls in the process of protein synthesis. But in this video, we're going to look at how this works in bacteria, uh, the prokaryotes. And a couple of things we need to remind ourselves about bacteria and their differences between eukaryotes. We have only our, our main chromosome here. Sometimes we might have extra smaller pieces of DNA with extra non-essential genes called plasmids. The DNA is circular rather than linear, and we have no nucleus, so the ribosomes can associate with the messenger RNA almost immediately after transcription. And there's no RNA processing or editing step in the bacteria. The other difference we find in bacteria's genomes is that genes are organized into clusters with other related genes, with some controlling sections of DNA called the promoter and the operator, in a unit that we call the operon. So let's take a closer look at that operon. So here's a section of the DNA, and the operon includes the promoter region, the section of DNA that the RNA must bind to in order to initiate transcription. The operator, a section of DNA that has this binding site for a repressor molecule that can block transcription. It's kind of like our on-off switch right there. And then a section of related genes, a cluster of related genes. Now these operons are going to work via feedback loops that are going to regulate the output of these genes in order to respond to environmental changes to maintain homeostasis. To get our head around how the operon model works to regulate gene control in prokaryotes, let's look at a, specific, a couple of specific examples, and we'll start with what we call the TRIP operon. And the TRIP operon contains a series of genes that are responsible for production of components that are needed to make tryptophan, an essential amino acid. So in the TRIP operon, RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter region of the DNA. So this is RNA polymerase. Now there is a repressor molecule, but in this case the repressor is inactive. As a result, the default position for this operon is on. The repressor is, is inactive, therefore RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and transcription can proceed. So if we have transcription followed by translation of these genes, then we end up in the production of tryptophan. So this operon is active and we're transcribing and translating and we're making tryptophan. But when we make tryptophan, tryptophan acts as a co-repressor. It binds to the repressor, making it active, changing its shape. And now this repressor can bind to the operator. And you see it dislodges the mRNA from the promoter, therefore blocking transcription, basically turning the operon off. So we have a, a set of genes whose job it is to produce tryptophan. And once we make tryptophan, the presence of tryptophan turns the system off. This is a negative feedback loop. And this operon is said to be repressible. It can be turned off. So now we stop making tryptophan. And as we start to consume tryptophan, using it up, um, then look what will happen. As tryptophan gets used up, the repressor is going to go back to its inactive state, allowing RNA polymerase to bind again to the promoter, and we'll start our production of tryptophan again. So this is a self-regulating system. Now let's look at a little tougher example, the LAC operon. Now in the LAC operon, our default position for the operon is off. The repressor is active and bound to the operator. Therefore, RNA polymerase can't bind to the promoter, and transcription is inhibited. Now, I failed to mention what the LAC operon is for. The LAC operon contains a series of genes responsible for production of three enzymes that together we can call lactase. Now, lactase is the enzyme needed to break down lactose. And we know that OSE, anything that ends in OSE in biology, is a sugar. And lactose is the sugar found in milk or dairy products. And lactase are the enzymes that are required, uh, required to break down lactose. So our default position for this operon is off. So the bacteria is not making lactase. Now, when lactose is present, it will bind to the repressor, 
causing it to change shape and release from the operator. So we are switching the system on in the presence of lactose, which makes sense. We don't need to make lactase unless we have lactose. But there's a little bit of a problem. It turns out that in this case, this RNA polymerase has a really hard time binding this promoter. It needs the help of a molecule called CAP. So even though lactose is present and we've removed the repressor from the operator, we still can't really activate this gene, this operon. We can't transcribe these genes. We need the help of another molecule called CAP. It'll help RNA polymerase bind to this promoter that it struggles to bind to. So here's CAP. And notice that it's inactive. It needs to be activated. It must be activated by a molecule called CAMP, which is cyclic adenosine monophosphate. It's relative to, related to adenosine diphosphate and adenosine triphosphate. It's basically ATP minus two of the phosphate groups. And so we need to have CAMP available in order to activate CAP to help the RNA polymerase bind to the promoter. And it turns out that cyclic adenosine monophosphate is only available when glucose levels are low. Let's think about what that implies. Glucose is more important to E. coli, the bacteria that we study the lac operon in. Uh, it's more important than lactose. Uh, it's easier to break down for, these, for the, uh, the bacteria. And so for the most part, they're going to be breaking down glucose instead of lactose. So even if lactose is present, the operon isn't used if glucose is available. But when glucose levels are low, CAMP, CAMP levels will rise. And when they, they rise, they'll activate CAP. And let's watch what happens. This activated CAP will help RNA polymerase bind to the promoter. And now we can transcribe and translate these genes to produce lactase. So we have two conditions required for the lac operon to be active. We need lactose present to remove the repressor from the operator and we need glucose scarce so that CAMP levels are high enough to activate CAP and CAP helps RNA polymerase bind to the promoter. Now that we have lactase though, let's see what happens. The lactase enzyme will attack the lactose, breaking it down. Now the lactose is gone from the repressor, the repressor can take back its active shape, bind to the operator, and turn off transcription. So we stop making lactase once we've broken down all of our lactose. Again, a self-regulating system. And that finishes our discussion on gene control uh, and eukaryotes and now prokaryotes. So look back over these videos, take your notes, and uh, email me if you have any questions. Or put any questions in the comment sections below this video.